because it's on one of my favorite books. This is a book that we've been recommending for approximately 20 years, and it was many years until I read it the first time for myself. It was one that a lot of therapists recommended that I'd heard lots of students talk about, but I had never really read. And then when I read it the, somewhere around 10 years ago, I was in, incredibly impressed with how deep and rich the allegory was and how, how it could lend itself to, to so many different phases of our life. And like a lot of allegories that, that, that are especially effective at meeting you where you're at, about speaking to you no matter where you are on your journey, I've found that uh, as I've read it a handful of times over the years since the original reading, that it means more and, and, and becomes more profound to me each time. It means something a little bit different. It's something that I'm going to be doing this week, today and Thursday. I'm going to be doing two books in a series that really match up well together. Um, so if you watch tonight, if you're watching this webinar, listening to this podcast, then make sure that you listen to the letters of Juliet that will be broadcast on Thursday. Um, and if you're listening to that, of course, you'll, you'll have already listened to this. And I'll announce that when I talk on Thursday. So with that introduction, let me talk a little bit about the, the, the model that this book is based on. And then I'm going to take you through the story of the book and try to share my own experiences, my own how I relate, but also how I've seen it relate to other people. A lot of my work is inspired by Joseph Campbell. You know that if you've read my book, if you've, of course, seen the title, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, it's based on a model that Joseph Campbell came up with. It's called The Hero's Journey. And The Hero's Journey is what Joseph Campbell concluded as a philosopher after studying all the world's myths and religions and, and epic stories and basically identified a pattern that was common to all these great myths and stories. And he called it The Hero's Journey. He wrote his seminal book is called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which later on became an inspiration for such stories as, as Star Wars. In fact, most storytellers, most people who write stories know about Joseph Campbell and study The Hero's Journey because it's an algorithm or a pattern that we find so commonly that they want to take advantage of the richness that it has to offer us. According to Joseph Campbell, myths are not a history lesson. Right? It's not literal. And he talks a lot about being metaphorically impaired or gifted. And this idea that when we are open, spiritually, psychologically, we can see the differences, we can see the similarities in ourselves and in the stories that we, we are inspired by and the stories that we enjoy. And we can see the value of them, what, what lessons they have to offer us. So myth is about this idea about something that we can resonate with, something on a higher plane, something that's more common. Jung might talk about it in terms, Carl Jung might talk about it in terms of the collective unconscious, these archetypes that we can all relate to that are, that are common to all these kinds of stories. When the meaning of a myth frightens us or makes us uncomfortable, we often interpret it literally so as not to, so as to escape its meaning from our consciousness. In other words, we look at it as a literal story about somebody else instead of being able, being able to identify that for us. And, Again, these applies, according to Joseph Campbell, these have application to all the world's myths and stories. Here's an image that I borrowed from a movie called Finding Joe that I highly recommend to anybody interested in, in more on this. Finding Joe is available on, on, on iTunes. You can rent it for, I think, $3. And it's a fantastic illustration of Joseph Campbell's work and model. Um, it, it's set to music and storytelling from children and has several guests from, from our, our current day culture to tell the story. But basically, this is the pattern that we go through in life that, that great storytelling illustrates for us. It, it really brings it out for us. And that is that we are called outside of the, the typical, outside of the usual, outside of our normal circumstances. And sometimes we're called by, by being shoved into it. Sometimes it's a crisis. In the case of the parents that I work with, it's a, it's a child struggling with mental health or addiction issues. And so that invites us to look at things and to be open to things and to consider things we haven't needed to consider, that, that our story has not yet required us to consider. It can happen with a divorce, with an illness, being fired from a job. Any crisis can kind of shove us into this need to look at something different. In Star Wars, the original Star Wars, Luke Skywalker came home and his aunt and uncle had died. And his home was destroyed, so there was nothing to go back to. So he was forced, although he was reluctant, he was forced to go out on, on his journey. And a lot of times, Joseph Campbell will talk about the initial call, the hero is reluctant to answer the call. 
the call can be heard if we're sensitive enough in a whisper, right? We can hear an idea or an invitation to think about, consider a, a new version of ourself, the next iteration of ourself. And if we're, we're quiet enough in our heart and open enough to it, we can hear it, but sometimes we need to be shoved. And then we're initiated into this separated from our, our, our commonplace world, what, we're feel, what we feel comfortable with, and we're initiated into this, <clears throat> this new world, this new paradigm with new challenges and new rules. I had one parent say to me during one of our Finding You seminars that it became a very frightening experience for them at one point when they, some of their most basic assumptions were questioned. They questioned them and realized that they might not be true. And then w with a wave, it came to them that maybe a lot of other things, maybe all the things that they believed in weren't true. And that can be very frightening for us because what we believe in keeps us feeling safe, right? We're comfortable with it. But when a new truth, and, and a lot of you can relate to this, there are new truth and, and new ideas that come into your awareness as you do the work that's asked of you as a parent in our program. So you're invited into this new world, and, and there are, are various themes that are common in these stories, in our stories. There's, there's entering the cave. There's... Um, magical helpers along the way, people that help us. And then finally, there's a, a final battle with, with ourselves, which is often illustrated with fighting some enemy, some, something that we imagine is outside of us. And then in defeating that enemy, we are also given access to the treasure that this story, that this wisdom has to offer. You'll notice that in a lot of stories, the hero doesn't come back with what he or she set out to find. And, and they come back empty-handed, so to speak. But what they have is a transformative experience. They have wisdom in, in the form of a, of a story, something to share, and they bring that back to the community to share it with others. In our program, in my experience, that's when parents become mentors. That's when students or clients have a story to, to share with their family or to bring, bring back to their community and to share with others. A lot of the students, and some of them, many of them, struggle through profound struggles. Right? Many parents have struggled through profound struggles and challenges and then come back with something incredibly wise. I, I was participating in a parent weekend this past weekend in Portland, Maine, at a program that I, I, I very much respect and appreciate. And there were three gentlemen there that were co-participating with me in this, this weekend that had a story of addiction and, and a significant amount of struggle, sometimes ending up in jail or, or a hospital, or in one case, 14 treatment centers before they found their sobriety. And, and one of the, the guests, one of my peers, colleagues, was sharing this idea that he looks back on, on the choices, on the mistakes, on, on stumbling, and he said, if he didn't have that, he wouldn't have the, 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 that part of his story to share with the young people that we were talking to that were struggling with addiction. And so he really values that. He honors that. He treasures it. It really does change when we look at our, our story in this way. It does change it from this simplistic, I'm going to go out and fix it and solve it and arrive to this idea that it all becomes valuable, that we, we make our suffering, our challenges, our struggles, we give them value. And then we have something to offer that we didn't have before. So old versions of ourselves die. And newer versions of ourselves are made alive in this process. One concept that Joseph Campbell talks about is this idea to learn to keep dying. He makes the comparison to, 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 a, to a snake. And a snake that cannot shed its skin will die. And for us... The same is true spiritually. We have to continue to be open to challenge ourselves to new ideas, new concepts, new learning. And when we do that, we can expand and transform far beyond the capacity that we enjoy today to something much greater, larger, and authentic. Campbell talks about it as a pattern or, or an algorithm that is predictive. And remember, for it to be your hero's journey, and I've, I see this in, in, in common literature and writing today, people misunderstanding the heroic part of the journey. The heroic part of the journey is not that you become something grand, something popular or famous to share with the world, like a lot of the stories that we read,
but that you can have a very quiet hero's journey, right? It can be in a very quiet family in your own personal life. In this algorithm, an algorithm is a procedure or a formula for solving a problem. We, we kind of learn the steps and we, we, it gives us comfort. So we're, that we're in the cave, that frightening, deep, dark place, when we're in the belly of the whale, that we have hope in that experience. From the Knight in the Nine Rusty Armor, he fights foes that were bad, mean, and hateful. He slew dragons and rescued fair damsels in distress, the book begins. When the knight's business was slow, he had the annoying habit of rescuing damsels, even if they did not want to be rescued. Although many ladies were grateful to him, just as many were furious with him. This he accepted philosophically. After all, one can't please everybody. So eager was he, in fact, that sometimes he would ride off in several directions all at once, which was no easy feat. So we begin with this description of the night. I think one of the common mistakes that I hear parents make in this process is they see this application to their child. And in many ways, the night in Rusty Armor is a fantastic story for children going into the wilderness. And the wilderness becomes both literally, in our case, and also metaphorically, a journey inside oneself. Right? And all of these stories, the, the place that we go, the place that our story, that our invitation asks us to go is often very intimidating and scary. For you, it might be walking into an al meeting or walk, walking into a parent support group or, a, or an evoke workshop or a finding you seminar. But in all of those came, things, it's not the literal place that you go to that frightens you. It's when you go to that place, you're asked to look inside of yourself. One of the, one of the things that I often say when I'm talking about this heroic journey, thinking about the knight in rusty armor, and also our own journey is no matter what the story is, the heroic journey is always inward. And all of those places that stories, that myths talk about are just metaphors for looking into the psyche, to those places inside of ourselves that we find uncomfortable, that are frightening. The Knight's family and the other characters in the early part of the story is his wife, Julia. We're going to talk about the sequel to this book that my therapist wrote on Thursday, and then, of course, his young son, son Christopher. So the knight is one of King Arthur's knights. He, he's wearing, he, he's similar to one of King Arthur's knights. It's not King Arthur, actually, but he's similar to those knights. He's wearing this armor, armor he's rescuing, he's slaying dragons. And as time went on, the knight became so enamored with his armor that he began wearing it to dinner and often to bed. His family began to forget how he looked without it. Again, what is the, the armor and the metaphor? It's the thing that protects us from perceived threats. And in the case of a knight, it's a literal threat of bows and arrows and then the teeth and claws of a dragon. But in this story, it's all the things that we perceive as a threat. And, and we like our armor. We, we, like, we like the way it looks. The, the one thing that, that is illustrated very well in these two stories is it's very easy to see other people's armor. I think that's a, a very tricky thing for us. It's much more difficult to see our own armor. It's very easy for us to see our children's armor. Our spouse's armor is very easy for us to see, but it's hard for us to see our own armor. His wife, Juliet, finally sick of him wearing his armor and, and the distraction, the difficulty that became in the house, threatened him and said, take off that armor so that I can say who you really are. She demanded this of him. He loved his wife and his son. But he also loved his armor because it showed everyone who he thought he was, a good, kind, and loving knight. Why couldn't Juliet, his wife, see all of these things? His armor kept him from feeling much of anything, and he had worn it for so long that he had forgotten how things felt without it. At some point when he met the squirrel later in his journey, the squirrel mentioned to him in discussing his armor, and, and as pieces started to come off, he said, you're becoming so sensitive enough to see that you can feel the vibrations of others. The best way for any of us to teach our children how to feel empathy for others is to teach them how to feel their feelings. The best way for us to develop empathy, empathy and awareness of how other people are feeling is to learn to feel ourselves. So when I'm treating people who have done horrible, unkind and cruel things to other people, I don't talk to them about how they're hurting those other people, not initially at all. 
I ask them how their day went. You know, the old therapist cliche about how do you feel is just a tool we use to teach people how to feel. And then ideally, I provide a safe place, my office, in the case of wilderness therapy, it's the circle that I sit in, the campsite that I'm sitting in. I allow people to feel without judgment, without correcting them, without telling them how it's irrational. Instead of doing all that and ultimately dismissing their feelings, I understand how it, how it looks and feels from their perspective. And then when they are allowed to feel, that muscle in them becomes stronger and stronger. And when one is allowed to feel one's pain, they recognize it in others. And I, I think a lot of the children that we see, parents complain about them not being able to feel or have empathy for others. So the way to encourage that, to facilitate that, is counterintuitive. We teach people how to feel, and then they can recognize, as the squirrel says, they become sensitive enough to feel the vibrations of others. So he received the ultimatum from his wife, the knight did. You know, Juliet had to feed him through the, the, the visor, feed him through a straw. She began sick and tired of it. At one point, she smashed a plate over his head, and he couldn't even feel it. So he went to the blacksmith, who was one of the strongest in all of the kingdom. And, he, and the blacksmith tried to pound it off, tried to break it off, tried to pry it off, and couldn't, had literally no effect upon, upon him. The knight said at one point, I got stuck with this armor. I had to wear it so uh, that I would always be ready for battle. And it served him. And so one of the things that we do when we're treating your children with substance abuse, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, self-harming, self-sabotage, all those things, is we understand what the armor serves, what their symptoms serve. And that's frightening for most people. It's frightening to understand, honor, and respect the symptoms because we fear that if we do, that we're giving them permission, that we're encouraging it, that we're endorsing it, when really we're just getting to the point where we can help them understand why they have it because the risk of removing one's armor is fantastic. When one's armor is removed, we are vulnerable to all kinds of pain, to grief, to sadness to hurt, to all the feelings that that armor serves to protect. So he goes to the blacksmith. He's not able to do it. He finally learns that he has to go, go find the king. So he goes to, to visit the king, and he finds that the king is gone, and he gets his feelings hurt that the king is gone. He meets the jester, glad bag. And one thing happens at each of his stages with the blacksmith, with the jester, and eventually when he meets up with the king, is he inadvertently hurts each one of them. He steps on the blacksmith's foot. He squeezes Gladstone, uh, Gladbag's hand too strongly. He steps on the knight. And in each instance, there's an illustration that what we do to protect ourselves hurts other people. The things that we do to shield us from pain end up inadvertently hurting other people. The confusing part of that, as a parent, as a loved one, is that we're just aware of having been hurt. It, it blinds us to see, and this book illustrates well when the king talks to him, it blinds us to see how the, the, the armor is hurting the individual that's wearing it. Unable to find it in his own kingdom, the knight decided to search another land. Somewhere there must be someone who knows how to get this armor off, he thought. Gladbad said, Glad Bag said to him, the jester said to him after his crushing handshake, when the armor's gone from you, you'll feel the pain of others too. I think that's such a profound thing to think about as a parent and as a loved one. When we take off our own armor, when we become vulnerable and subsequently safe for others, we'll have a, a greater capacity for empathy for others. He went into the woods. The woods, again, become a metaphor for the psyche, the self. The woods are a therapy session. The woods are a support group. The woods are a 12-step group. So he goes into the woods, and on his journey, he finds himself becoming weaker and weaker in the story, and at a time when he was even weaker than, than usually. Here's a quote from the book. The knight, the knight climbed off his horse and said to Merlin, I've been looking for you. He found Merlin at his, at his weakest point. I've been looking for you. I've been lost for months. 
You've been lost all of your life, corrected Merlin. The knight stiffened. I didn't come all this way to be insulted. Perhaps you have always taken the truth to be an insult, said Merlin. But because he was too weak to run, too, too weak to try something else, right? This is the bottom. This is when we surrender. This is when we say, what I'm doing, everything I'm doing is not working. A lot of times in our stories, it has to get worse. It has to get worse for our children, and it even has to get worse for us. We hold on tightly to old ideas. We hold on tightly to believing that we can control things. I love one of the quotes that they talk about in AA. One of my peers, one of my colleagues shared this quote. This weekend, he said, God, my, my higher power, he said, and I have one big thing that, that makes us different. There's one thing that, that makes us different. He said, my higher power never believes that he's me. So we, we think we're in control. We think we can prevent it. I had one father come up to me several times throughout the weekend as I was talking about this idea of letting go, of surrendering, of, of not controlling, of looking at it differently even appreciating the challenges that our, our children are presenting to us, having a different perspective. But he came up to me several times, five or 10 minutes there, here, there, to talk about it. And, and, and he was saying to me, Brad, but ultimately these are bad things, ending up in prison, ending up getting kicked out of school, ending up dead. These are horrible things. And I said, yes, they're all undesirable things. Nothing you would want for yourself or for your son. And in the end, the main point is you can't control it. There's nothing you can do to prevent it. So what you do is you look at what you can control. You look at yourself. You try to, try to make the biggest difference you can without this belief that you're in control of everything. There's a, there's a great line in here, too, where, where the, the knight realizes, Merlin tells him, as he's too weak to run, he explains to him that a person must stay in one place for a while to learn something. And I think that's true of us. Like We have to recognize, we have to listen, and we have to be able to recognize the story that is right before us. And so much of the time, we're running and we're distracting ourselves. But in the present moment, where we're at, there's so much truth being spoken to us that if, we, if we're quiet enough and slow enough and not in a hurry to get to the outcomes, we can hear it. The most common quote that my clients have shared with me over the years when I ask them what you got out of the book, what did you get out of the book, is this idea that is throughout the book, that we learn to accept life and not expect from life. And I think a lot of people, so many of the parents over the years are confused by this, by this idea of surrender, of radical acceptance, of acceptance. Right? They, they, they think it means giving up, not trying, not doing anything, being passive. It doesn't mean that. It means learning to accept what you cannot control and focusing on what you can. So he's invited to go on this path of truth. And along the path of truth, he's going to run into three different castles. And he can't go around them, and he can't rush through them, but each of them hold a lesson for him. He's also taught patience in the story. You've been waiting, wearing that armor for such a long time. Don't expect to be rid of it just like that, right? That, that's an obvious application to all of us. A lot of parents, because they're so good at problem solving, a lot of clients are so intelligent so bright that they expect the answer just to be presented to them. And it doesn't work that way. It's a process. If the answer is not a destination, if the answer is a new way of being, learning to be in a different way is going to take some time. And that's why in my own experience as a client and as a therapist, one must commit to many, many years of, of, of the work. That can be in therapy. It can be in recovery groups or, or other kinds of groups, support groups. But commit to it over, over several years. And to not be fooled, I, I think one of the most disappointing moments for me, for somebody, 
is when their child gets quote unquote better, when their child is out of the woods, so to speak, and gets clear of the crisis, and then a parent relaxes, assumes that mission accomplished, things are done, and then goes back to kind of status quo. But instead, receiving the invitation and following it and making it a lifelong practice. The knight didn't understand this, of course, he said. The knight said, I don't understand. That is because you are trying to understand with your mind, your old mind. But your mind is limited. And so these, these initial conversations with the knight were very difficult for him to understand. How many people have told me over the years that whether it be my book or these webinars or podcasts that the early viewing, the early reading, either made no sense to them at all, they didn't know what I was talking about, or, or it annoyed them. Right? The very similar process to what is described in, in Robert Fisher's book with the initial conversation between Merlin and the knight. The, the, there's this idea in the book that he talks about that if you were really good, why did you have to prove it? Right? If you were a, a really good person, why did you need armor to prove it? I think that's a really powerful example. I talk about this. I, uh, one of the presenters at, at this this weekend was a Buddhist monk. And he talked about this in his way very powerfully. If we know we're okay, if we have a sense of okayness that comes from deep work, then we, are, we have compassion on everybody else. So when somebody hurts us, some, something harsh against us, even cruel against us, we don't have to fight it off. We don't have to repress or ignore or shove down significant hurt. It doesn't hurt us. Because in knowing that we are okay, all that we are left with is the ability to see the other person. And so as I've grown in my own work, and of course this is more easy, more it's easier outside of my family, more difficult the closer you get in my family, more difficult in marriage, but I'm, but I'm better at it than I used to be. That when somebody tries to hurt me, I just see their woundedness. When I'm depleted, tired, emotionally drained, fragile, vulnerable, and somebody does that to me, of course, I get angry. I lash out back. I point out to them. I, I use all of my therapeutic tools to fight back and point out their diagnoses, their rational behavior, you know, their issues. But when I'm okay, when I'm grounded, when I'm full, I just see them. And, and I'm not ignoring hurt. I'm actually not hurt by it because it's not about me. It's the same concept that is in the book, The Four Agreements. And one of the agreements is don't take it personally. If somebody says you're wonderful, it's not about you. If somebody says you're horrible, it's not about you. He even goes so far as to say if somebody punches you in the face, it's not about you. That takes work. That takes capacity, and that's what Merlin is talking about here. And then, of course, he talks about how the answers are inside the night. And this journey that he's on, this path of truth that will help him to get the armor off, it is, has, holds the key, and the key is inside of him. At one point, of course, he considers running or returning, quitting the journey. A lot of people talk about this in therapy, right? It's so painful, this, this awakening process. It's so scary. It looks like a breakdown sometimes. Brene Brown talks about it in her landmark, landmark TED Talk. It looks like somebody's coming apart or having a crisis. And, of course, her therapist responds to her and says, this is called awakening. You're cracking the shell of your understanding. It doesn't matter that I said to Juliet or Christopher whether I get my armor off or not. Do it for yourself, Merlin said. Being trapped in all that steel has caused you much difficulty. Thinking he had been lost in the woods, I didn't follow any path. I was lost for woods. People are aware of the path they are on, said Merlin. So this applies, I think, very well to a lot of the parents that I work with. If you, if you do it for yourself. But most parents find that motivation very elusive and difficult. And they'll only do it if they think it'll help their children. But in so doing, they end up asking their children to give back something to them. So do it for yourself. 
and do it because it will it will unfetter you it will get you clear he on the path of truth meets up with squirrel and rebecca the bird the pigeon and and one thing happens as he starts to lose his armor he actually can hear the bird and the pigeon talk and that's when they mentioned that since he's learning to feel that he can recognize the very vibrations of feelings in others you're in no shape to rescue anyone you can't even take care of yourself that's a pretty big indictment that if applied to parents i think might be hard might sting he talks about how learning to to, to know himself more is akin or or, or exactly the same as self-love and as he cries through each part of his journey some new grief some new awareness the tears rust a part of the armor off and it starts to fall off his visor fell off from the rust from the tears after he read his son's blank letter he received a letter from his son that was blank because ultimately his son didn't know him had nothing to say there was no relationship he could now see more and he could feel the cold air on his face and so learning to, to feel opens us up to more feeling the first castle that he visited was the castle of silence where there was no sound he encounters the king in this castle he'd been told by gladbag that the king was on a crusade so he encounters the king in the castle of silence and asks him about that he said i heard that you were on a crusade and the king says everybody understands crusades but few understand truth the path of truth for for you folks how familiar does that sound to you it's very hard to explain what path you're on to your friends who aren't on this path and at the same time it's almost effortless to be able to explain that to people that are already on the path you don't, you don't even need to explain it and so many people ask you know, what should we tell our friends what do we tell them where our son is and that's what this is talking about that people that are on this path you have to say very little for them to understand it the king talked about being stuck and needing this path and then he comes back to it now and again to, to spiritually and emotionally, emotionally fortify, fortify himself the knight says to the king i never thought of you being stuck king you are so wise the king laughed ruefully i have enough wisdom to know when i am stuck and to return here so i can learn more about myself at one point he, he stomped on the king's toe and he felt so badly like i described earlier because he loved the king he thought the king was amazing he, he nearly worshipped the king and he thought the king would be upset with him and the king wasn't upset with him he said that armor hurts you more than it hurts me and in the castle of silence he had to learn to be alone to come into contact with himself he had to learn to enjoy and appreciate the present moment how many of us on this path where our children with our children who are struggling can find peace in the present moment joy in the present moment wisdom the treasure of the present moment in the silence he got in touch with his wife's pain at one point he was told that he could call merlin back at any point merlin had set him out on this path of truth and so merlin went away and so merlin said i'll come back whenever you you need me and at one point Merlin came back and answered a question the king had not yet asked. And the king was, was, was afraid and said, said, can you read my mind? And Merlin said, since I know myself, I know you. Right? That's what happens when we do our own work. What Carl Jung said was, the best way to understand somebody else's darkness, think of my child's problems and darkness and troubles. The best way to understand somebody's own somebody else's darkness is to come to know your own darkness and then it's easy to understand other people no matter how crazy or different they seem to you so he gets his way through the castle of knowledge begins to encounter himself finds his own name sees himself sits with himself more tears more in touch with his wife's pain and sorrow goes along the the, the castle of knowledge and comes to goes along the, the path of truth and, and comes to the castle of knowledge and the castle of knowledge the lessons were the more that you know the more that you'll see you know in my own experience as a client over the years having been in therapy with this therapist for nearly 20 years and with 
previous therapists and programs for 10 or 15 years and off, off and on, the more I'm aware of my limitations. You know, after writing the, the, the book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, I am much more aware, even since writing that, of all of the struggles and, and trials, or excuse me, all of the struggles and challenges I have as a father. 20 years ago, I thought I was a much better father than I, than I, than I think of myself now. When in reality, I'm, I'm a better father. I'm a more enlightened father than I was 20 years ago. But I couldn't see it then. So one of the things that happens, the more we learn, is we see. And we see because we get rid of the shame. We see because we allow ourselves to see. It doesn't threaten us to see our idiocies, to see our part in things. Right? We start to have the experience, hopefully in therapy or in a 12-step group or, or somewhere, we start to have the experience in presence of an empathic other that we're okay, even with all of our limitations. And since we're okay with all those limitations, we can see them in the light more, where we, where we welcome them more. There's a great lesson in the Castle of Knowledge of mistaking need for love. I think parents do that very easily. It's not the same thing. Love is about giving. Needing means that I, I want something from you. So in some ways, they're, they're, they're kind of the opposite. Love is self-serving. If I need my children, need their love, need their appreciation, need them to think of me a certain way, need that from my wife, versus love, which means I want to give. I want to do what I can do, what I need to do to support them, get to get to where they need to go. And I think for parents, because most of us were raised in homes where this was confused, I think we inadvertently ask our children to take care of us. We ask them to look at, look at us a certain way. We even think when they don't look at that, us that way, we think that that's a, a sign of their mental health, that they're not doing well if they're angry with us or upset with us or not grateful for us. I, I was talking to a client this past week and she was describing a dynamic in her family where her children were, were very angry with her. And she was talking about how her husband came to her and was protecting her, right, rescuing her, telling her that, that it was about them. And at one point she said to him, I think it's okay. I think it's okay that they're, that they're angry. I think it's okay that they're hurt. It's hard, but I want to learn to listen to them hear them but there was this instinct in the husband to protect her from that to protect her from that feeling of feeling attacked or depleted when that's not what parenting parenting is really about he needed the love of others because he didn't love himself impatient the night thought I want to find my way through this castle so fast so i can get to the top of the mountain maybe you're supposed to learn Maybe what you're supposed to learn here is that you have all the time in the world, suggested the pigeon. And so, again, sometimes we think that it's the destination, that there, there's a, a place to arrive. In my experience, arriving is the death of it all. Arriving is unenlightenment. Right? I found a fortune cookie uh, with a fortune in it in about 1994, I think in San Bernardino, California. I used to use this in therapy all the time with, with the teenagers that I work with. When they would tell me that they weren't getting anything out of the program and they couldn't learn anything here and that I wasn't a good therapist, I would share with them. I wish I still had this, this, this fortune. It said, the wise man learns more from the fool than the fool learns from the wise man. Right? The wisest people, the wisest teacher are always learning. And blame, there's a lesson here versus blame versus accountability, right? There's so much shame heaped upon us. We feel responsible for other people's issues, for their successes even, instead of just being accountable for ourselves, for our part in it, right? You can't control, for example, you can't control whether your children are sober and 
graduate from college and get married and have kids. You can't control that. What you can control is being honest, being authentic, being courageous, being compassionate, being clear with your communication, assertive, practicing healthy self-care, on and on and on. He encounters a mirror, and he didn't recognize, of course, the person in the mirror. Um, and the mirror was his real self, real self, beautiful, innocent, and perfect. He'd spent so much time in his life trying to be that, aspiring to that, that he didn't, because he didn't know that he was already that. And I would say that about all of you, not knowing all of you, I, I wish that I could give to you what my therapist has given to me, which is the knowledge that you're okay. You're, you're, you're wonderful. That doesn't mean you're perfect or flawless. It means that your flaws make sense. It means that your imperfections make sense in your story. And if you knew that, you could be uh, so much more of a powerful partner and parent. That's the work to, to know that about ourselves, what's already true about ourselves. He'd been working his whole life to be liked, the thing that he, th he wanted his whole life, but he hadn't. He needed to learn the lessons that he needed to learn. He called this ambition. This idea, that this, this quote that he read about ambition in the Castle of Knowledge. Humans want to be better than they are, but that is impossible because they're already wonderful and precious. So he makes it through the castle of knowledge with the lessons that are there, and he's on his way to the castle of will and daring. And as he's approaching the castle of will and daring, he comes into contact with the dragon of fear and doubt. And there's a dynamic between the, the dragon that when he goes toward the dragon, it gets smaller, but initially he runs away from the dragon. Then the dragon blows flames and burns his bottom. He soaks his bottom in the, in the creek and the river. And as he's sitting there with his burned bottom, his helpers tell him that his believing in the dragon made it real. That it was his belief that it could hurt him that made it real. And so there's so much... Mark Twain says that the one thing that is certain if, if we face our fears is the death of that fear. You know, putting off things, procrastinating, avoiding things. But, what, but if we approach our dragons, if we approach th those things that we think we ought not to do, and if we do, we're going to die or suffer, then they get smaller. And if we run from them, they get bigger. If you face the dragon, there's a chance it will destroy you. But if you don't face the dragon, it will surely destroy you. It will come back again and again, but you'll be stronger, and the fear and doubt will be weaker. So that's our work. We go to meetings, we go to therapy, we go to groups, we tell our story. We face it over and over again. We face the fear that we should be something that we already are. That we should, that we need to be a certain way to be loved, to be liked, to be okay. When we really are okay. And eventually he makes it past the dragon, and he gets to the summit of truth. And there he encounters a quote that says, Though this universe I own, I possess not a thing, for I cannot know the unknown, if to the known I cling. And it's about, again, letting go. My therapist, who's in her late 70s, says most people die long before they're dead. Right? My grandfather, I say, he knew all the truth that there was to know from the best that I can gather by the time he was 30. There was no new truth for him. He'd figured it all. He had all the answers. But practicing the beginner's nine, being open, assuming that this lesson, right? In some cultures, children are, are the teachers. Their addictions, their depression, their anxiety, their acting out, their anger, it's here to teach you something. And it will keep teaching it to you until you don't need to learn it anymore. And that's what this whole process is about for us. What are the knowns that you have clung to in your life? The things you knew absolutely were true. 
And usually what happens for the parent that I work with is because they know all the answers and know all the truth because they think that's their job, they think they're capable of that, they impose that truth on their children, right? I know all of your truths. I was talking about this with the parents this weekend, that having faith in your children doesn't mean that you have faith that well, everything will turn out exactly the way you hope and want it. It means that you trust in, in a higher power in the universe and your child, that you love and, and, and give a witness to their story as it unfolds, and that it'll turn out entirely different than, than anything you could imagine. It's a, it's a trust, it's a letting go, it's a surrendering. At one point, he lets go on the summit of truth and he falls upward. Again, it's that idea of surrendering. Somebody asked if I could define surrender. It's not passive, but willing to accept what you can't control. Surrender is I can't control what you think of me. I can't control, control your choices. The problem with that is that so many of us are good at getting what we want, at manipulating others. Sometimes in a positive way, as leaders, as bosses, entrepreneurs, right, coaches, we're so good at getting people to perform, to behave the way that we want them, that we believe the illusion that we're actually in control. So you learn to let go of what you can't control. You can't control what your child does. Not ultimately. And some of them go to fantastic and great lengths to prove that to you. But what you can control is what you do do, including showing up courageously and honestly and authentically and clearly. The frightening thing about showing up courageous and, and honest and authentic is that you'll do crazy things like tell people the truth. And in so doing, you lose control over them. They get to react how they react. One of my favorite lines in The Knight in Rusty Armor, at each stage, he cries. Like I said, he experiences some new awareness, some new grief, some new part of himself. And he cries. And, and piece by piece, his armor falls off. And toward the end of the book, there's the quote, I nearly died from all the tears I left unshed. The result of this journey is that we find connection to everyone and everything. To, to life, to, to, to everything. What are the take-home messages as, as I gather them from this book? It is that you are on your own quest. This webinar, this journey, although it gets framed initially as being about your child, the child that is here, it is not. It is about you. You have to enter the forest, similar to the way the Knights in the King Arthur story did each following his own path into the forest, where there was no path. The motif of death in storytelling is that something in us must die in order for part of us to emerge. It's the death of what we thought and had planned for us, the death of ego, the death of being something for somebody, what the world thinks. Well, somebody gave me a book during one of my few midlife crises that said the death of a hero. It was called The Death of a Hero, The Birth of a Soul. This idea that I had to be something as a man to the world, to my wife, to my children, instead of just being who I was. You'll meet helpers along the way, right? Your wilderness therapists, a sponsor, a mentor, other people that are on their path of truth. And you'll, you'll recognize them because... They won't give you advice. They won't share their, their truth with you in such a way to impose it on you. They'll share it with you to give an example of what, what theirs is like. They'll, ex they'll share their experience and, and strength and hope, but they won't impose it on you. They'll never tell you what you should do. They'll just share with you their own story, their own elixir, their own wisdom. You'll, you'll recognize these helpers because they won't do those things to you. They won't give you advice. You'll become, a, you'll become the master of two worlds, of the world that, that you knew and of this new world, and you'll find your own story. And then you'll have something to share with your children 
and you'll recognize that the 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 wisdom that you have in many ways came from all of your mistakes and all of your detours and so you won't look back at them with regret you'll look back at them with gratitude and when your mistakes and your challenges and your suffering become of such value to you you won't be afraid of the future you won't live in a, a trauma-based way so as to try to protect yourself from, from the possibility of the next challenge. I agree that our work, let, let me go over any live questions you have. I agree that our work is not done after our child, child treatment. As a co-parent, I find that getting on the same page with my partner in parenting decisions is important. I can be impatient. I want to decide something before reviewing it with, our part, with my partner. Our 18-year-old son is more than two years sober, and after 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 the wilderness therapy program and Imbalance Ranch, it looks like he is back at Imbalance Ranch working now. I find myself wanting to relax and stop planning for limits we may need to set. He could show back up here, saying that he wants to practice to be a musician and live in our house. One of my big lessons is that I hate saying no. I need to spend time with my husband, and my husband. And with my husband and my husband figuring out what we want so we will know how to respond when he shows back up home with a plan that isn't our plan for him. You're on the path. You're right. You need to figure out who you are, what you want, how you can participate, and, and why saying always oh, difficult for you. What does that mean to you? Where does that come from? There's a, there's a story in that, right? I have the same kind of difficulty. And so when we find that story, when we find where that came from, then we can start to become free from it. That's an important part of the journey. Uh, next comment. Great webinar, Brad. I never get tired of hearing the story of the night. I need to hear it periodically. Got to keep growing. Thank you. What's your most important takeaway from this book? Hmm. What's my most important takeaway from this book? It's hard to narrow it down to just one. I, I think it's just it's simple. I guess it's just being on the path and realizing that there are very few people that are on it. And the people that aren't on it don't understand it, don't know what it is, just like the king talked about. And that I want to find and be around people who are on their path of truth but it's unique and personal to all of us. And so I just want to be on it. I want to be on it forever. That's why I continue to go to therapy because I don't, I can't, I don't know what it means to be done. And I, and I like the tool of therapy for myself as a client. I like what it offers me. I, I like my work. If I won the lottery tomorrow, I, I really don't know how things would change for me and what I do day to day. I love being on this path. I love shedding some light on other people's path without dictating or telling them where to go, just kind of being present with them and, and maybe shining a little bit of light on, on where they're at and, and how they're traveling. I would encourage all of you to, to, if you haven't read this book, to read it. If you haven't read it for years, to read it again. Like I said, it, it means something more and something different each time I read it. Next question. I often have difficulty understanding the letting go piece that knows I cannot control my child's destiny and the boundaries I can impose because my son is financially dependent upon us. How can I differentiate control and the boundaries that I want to set? We'll talk about that a little bit on Thursday, so I hope you tune in for that, but it's hard. That's a really, really, really great question and a difficult question. It's, it's really looking at what am I trying to do? Am I trying to take care of myself with what I feel comfortable with or am I trying to control an outcome? The, the language that I ask parents to use when setting a boundary is, this is what I need to do to take care of myself. Right? That's what boundaries are. Many people think boundaries are about trying to control, manipulate, right? change somebody else, but they're about self-care. I have found that my boundaries have become more flexible as I become older, not because I'm afraid to say no, but because I'm more comfortable with not having to control something. I think that's a great question around money, too. A lot of parents have that. 
But if you're trying to fix them, don't do it. That's not what a boundary is. A boundary is this is what I feel comfortable supporting. This is what I can do and what I can't do in this situation. Then when they accuse you of being controlling, you don't have a lot of doubt about it because you're very clear that it's about you. I'm not comfortable supporting this, this experiment, this project, this way anymore. I love you. It won't come from a place of rage or anger or frustration or control. It'll come from a place of healthy self-care. Can you repeat once again the difference between love and need? Love is about giving and need is about getting. That's the simplest way to do it. But I used to think that I used to think that needing my children, I think it's because I grew up with a father who really wasn't there for me. And so I wondered how he could allow me to kind of drift out of his life. I wondered that, especially after I had my young children. So I thought needing my young children, that's the way I, I thought that was like the highest form of love. But I, I don't feel that way as much anymore. I, I want to give to them, but I don't want something from them. I don't want an accomplishment. I don't want them to be a certain way. I had a, 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 a child in the wilderness ask me many years ago. He kind of interrupted me as I was teaching this lesson about my own version of the truth, my, my truth. And he said, surely you'd be proud. He just stopped. I think it might have been his first or maybe his second week, recovering heroin addict. And he said to me, surely. If your daughter got into Harvard, you'd be proud of her. And I said, not if I was in my right mind. I'd be happy for her if that's what she worked for. But ideally, it wouldn't make any difference to me. It could be evidence of something going well in her life, but not necessarily even. There are, There is such a thing as an unhappy Harvard graduate. So I don't necessarily believe that that's true. And so I don't need her to get into Harvard. I don't need her to stop doing drugs. I don't need something from her. I'm here to give. I'm here to love. And there's more to it. There's a great book called The Eden Project, The Search for the Magical Other by James Hollis, if you want to hear about this more in, in terms of marriage. Hi, Dr. Brad. This is my absolute favorite story. Funny how I initially related to the night until I read The Letters of Juliet. I can't wait to talk about The Letters of Juliet because it's a wonderful sequel. Wonderful. Thank you. Next question. Now that my son is, now that my 16 year old son is just two weeks home after 112 days out of Oak and eight months at a residential treatment center, I'm witnessing my own change in our new relationship. Although I still slip and catch myself. I, I more see how I've changed and how I am grateful. The symbolism in this book is beautiful and so true. When I first sent my son away a year ago, I thought my work was over. I thought I would just pay, uh, I thought I would just pay a vote and RTC and lay back on the couch until he came home a golden boy. I was completely unprepared for this heroic journey. And indeed, and indeed hard it was. Yet I am so grateful. So grateful am I now. It feels great now to be able to relate with clarity and simplicity, boundaries, following through, etc. Even though I know more changes are here to are, are to come, I have changed. Thank you, and I'm so happy for you. And it really is a heroic journey. It really is a fantastic and heroic journey. And the heroic journey isn't about being this great and, and wonderful hero. It's about doing hard things. It's about looking at yourself, folks. Most people won't do this work. Many of the parents that we work with, maybe because we kind of gently, lovingly beat them over the head with it over and over again, they eventually accept the invitation. But a lot of treatment programs, a lot of therapeutic interventions uh, uh, don't do it, and a lot of parents even don't respond to it. So if you've responded to it, congratulations. That means something about you. It really does mean something about you. Thank you for this webinar. I needed this tonight. After several therapeutic programs, my son is entering college next month. He is not sober. I'm holding my boundary. He cannot stay with me if he is not sober. Drugs, alcohol, tobacco. So he is with his grandparents who enable. I have been struggling. So needed this reminder. Letting go of the outcome, keeping the focus on myself. I went back to Codependence Anonymous two weeks ago. He told me tonight via phone he was going to take 
two years off after college. Normally, I would have freaked out. I kept hearing what you would keep saying. I let go of the outcome, focus on what I could change, which is me. Fantastic job. All right, folks, it's been a, a treat to revisit this. I look forward to Thursday night. Um, here's some upcoming uh, events and, and announcements. And, and stay tuned for, for parent support groups if, you, if you're interested in parent support groups because I have a whole list of them coming up. Um, we want all parents to attend while their child is with us. Six of these 12 step support groups, either Al Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous. Um, these are parent support groups for people who have loved ones that are struggling with addiction, but also any other self sabotaging behaviors. You can go to their websites to find more information and meetings in your area, naranon.org and also alateen.org, which is for uh, young people. You can also go to nami.org and find out information, resources in your area. Uh, free classes and resources in your area. All of our webinars from now on are on podcasts. You can give that to your friends. And, and, and please, I encourage the proliferation of these because we just want more good done in the world. Uh, the podcasts, you can find them on your iPhone device, on the podcast app, search Evoke Therapy Programs, and on Android devices, download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. On Facebook, search Evoke Therapy Programs. The Second Nature Alumni Foundation on Facebook is an organization that helps people who can't afford treatment. We've helped several people uh, with, in conjunction with them, go through treatment in a way that they can afford. Um, you can also look on our blog on our, on our website. My book is The Journey of the Heroic Parent. If you haven't done so yet, please go to Amazon and uh, give me an honest review of the book. Really helpful. You can find it on Amazon.com. Right now, it's temporarily out of, of stock on Amazon, but we're going we're gonna to fix that as soon as possible. You can find copies of it on barnesandnoble.com. You can also get uh, Kindle versions of it on Amazon. Um, and also CD or Audible uh, versions of it are available on Amazon. Go to the Parent Alumni Foundation book page and go to find books that we recommend, our therapists recommend, and you buy those, and a percentage of the proceeds goes to the charity to help people that, um, that can't afford treatment. Uh, here are parent support groups. Some of these are tentative, and we're going to be rolling these out. New York City, Wednesday, September 13th. The Los Angeles area, Sunday, September 24th. The Bay Area, the next day, the 25th. We're also going to be this late summer, early fall. We're going to be going to Toronto, Nashville, and Chicago. And the week of October 10th through 13th, while the, the play Wilderness is there, we're going to have a parent support group that week in, uh, near Washington, D.C. Email Andrea at evoketherapy.com to RSVP or for more information. Upcoming workshops, the next workshop is just right around the corner, is July 29th and 30th. We, we want everybody who can go to these, every current parent who can go to these, to go to these wonderful experiential workshops to meet with our staff, other families. You can combine that with a field visit if, you're, if your Evoke therapist thinks it's appropriate for timing. Contact Gail at evoketherapy.com for more information. The next Finding You workshop, we just finished one last week. The next one is in Toronto. The spaces are, are limited, and they're going fast, so please sign up if you're interested because we have more people that are interested right now that are on the fence, and if all of them signed up, we'd run out of space and not even have room for all of them. And then we'll do, be doing another one in September. Uh, you, can, you can, for more information on, on, our, on our private family intensives or our pursuits programs, go to our website or email intensives at evoketherapy.com. Pursuits programs are high adventure programs, international programs for young adults and for families. And then, like I have said many times tonight, this Thursday I'm going to be going over uh, a sequel that was written by my therapist. She's written about over a dozen books in this wonderful piece that I think does a fantastic job in complementing the night story, The Letters of Juliet to the Night in Rusty Armor. That'll be this Thursday, the 27th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Look forward to sharing that with you folks. Uh, everybody have a, have a great couple of days, and I'll see you in about 48 hours. Take care. Bye-bye.